All right, welcome everybody. Again, my name is Bruce Gartner, uh, the administrator for the Howard County Office of Transportation. We're here this evening uh, to host uh, MDOT and Secretary Slater's team for the um, discussion of the most recent draft CTP, FY22 through 27. Uh, before I introduce the county executive for a few opening remarks, I'll just go through the, um, the run of show and a few ground rules for this evening. Uh, so we are being recorded. We will occasionally ask the interpreter to identify uh, themselves uh, so that they can pop back up um, for the uh, to be seen on on camera. Um, we will will be uh, recognizing elected officials at the uh, at the end uh, for questions. And uh, also, if anyone um, wants to uh, make a comment, ask a question, need assistance, we are monitoring the Howard County um, Office of Transportation email. That's transportation at howardcountymd.gov. So um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to County Executive Ball um, to, uh, to, to officially welcome MDOT and Secretary Slater's team, and I'll uh, take it back over when um, the next step. Thank you. Well, good evening, Secretary Slater and to the entire team at MDOT. Really appreciate uh, your continued partnership and having uh, this time with you. Uh, thank you again for your support and especially the recent funding commitments to Howard County related to construction of the US 1 safety improvements that we've worked together on for the past few years. The provision of the federal funding for transit, which will allow the county to address bus replacement backlog and needs, and the Maryland 32 alternate bike route, and the recently announced award of $1.1 million in design funds for shared use path on Ten Oaks Road, Guilford, and Maryland 108. As indicated in our priority letter, the US 1 and US 29 corridors continue to be high on our list of requested improvements. This is clear by our submission of federally designated project requests for both corridors. On US-1, we're looking for federal and state support to advance the planning, design, and construction of additional recommended safety improvements. This includes improving pedestrian and bicycle safety and access, as well as bus stops where appropriate. These investments will greatly benefit all users of the corridor, especially as we've seen a spike in pedestrian fatalities in recent years. On US 29, we've heard that you do not have any plans at this time to change the configuration of the US 29 access to the River's Edge community. As we discussed last month, this is an important issue to both the River's Edge community and commuters on the corridor. So we need to stay in close communication regarding the SHA plans and in this area if there are any kind of changes. Even more important, we would like MDOT's continued support to Montgomery and Howard County's efforts to improve transit on the corridor by participating in funding of new buses for the extension of flash service to Columbia and the design of phase two of the Montgomery County bus rapid transit project. Finally, I would like to echo the concerns of my colleagues in the Baltimore region regarding the governor's veto of the Transit Investment Act. While we appreciate the MTA's continued focus on implementation of the Regional Transit Plan, we are concerned about the transit investment in the Baltimore region. We are pleased to see the increased investment in the draft CTP, but I have to say, Howard County and my colleagues in the Baltimore region are hoping that we can work together to achieve more balance in the final CTP to be released in January. Again, thank you so much for your time, consideration, and partnership 
working on better ways to safely and efficiently create a multimodal infrastructure to help not only move people, but empower people to live their very best lives. Thank you. Thank you, County Executive. Secretary Slater, uh, why don't you go ahead and um, start your remarks and introduce your team. Great, thank you so much, Bruce, and, and thank you to County Executive Law. It's always great to see you. For the record, my name is Greg Slater. I'm the Secretary of the Maryland Department of Transportation. Thank you to, for inviting us to provide an overview of our draft six-year consolidated transportation program. It's the covering fiscal years 22 to 27. First, let me introduce the MDOT team with me today. Uh, Administrator Tim Smith from the State Highway Administration, as well as our District Engineer, Terry Seuss. From the Maryland Transportation Authority, we have Capital Planning Director, Melissa Williams. From the Maryland Transit Administration, we have Acting Administrator, Holly Arnold. From the Motor Vehicle Administration, we have Administrator, Chrissy Neiser. From the Maryland Aviation Administration, we have Executive Director, Ricky Smith, and Planning and Engineering Chief, Paul Shank. Also joining us from the Secretary's Office is Regional Planner, Dan Janicek, uh, and our State Legislative Officer, Melissa Einhorn. It's great to be speaking with our partners here in Howard County. I wish we could be meeting in person, but as you know, we've learned a great deal about what we can accomplish together, even in this virtual setting over this last year and a half. For instance, I know last night, members of our MDOT team held a virtual community meeting on the proposal for the Transit Oriented Development Project at the Dorsey Mark Station. It's great to be working with the community and with the county to explore what a TOD at Dorsey Station might offer us. And I look forward to sharing progress as that proposal advances. 2020 was a challenging year for many of us. The COVID-19 pandemic led to record decreases in travel and a significant drop in our revenues in the Transportation Trust Fund. The good news is that those trends have started to recover in recent months. Today's travel volumes have reached and in some cases surpassed uh, pre-pandemic levels from 2020 in 2021. During the peak of last year's stay-at-home order, traffic volumes dropped more than 50%. But in the third week of September, traffic on Maryland highways was down just 7% compared to the same period in 2019. On the other hand, with Maryland's economic, economy recovering and the supply chain trying to meet that growing demand, we, stall, we saw statewide truck volumes up 9% compared to the same period in 2019. At Maryland's toll facilities, transactions so far for September are just above the transaction volumes for the same period in 2019. During the peak of the stay-at-home order last year, transactions on Maryland toll roads dropped 58%. Overall, our passenger volumes at BWI Thoroughgood Marshall Airport remain about 25% lower than the 2019 levels as business travel lags behind some of that leisure travel but air traffic continues to grow on a weekly basis at our great airport. The Port of Baltimore has seen a robust rebound from the pandemic, reflecting that consumer demand for goods and, and Maryland's stature as that key hub for a growing e-commerce industry. We were privileged to host US DOT Secretary Pete Buttigieg uh, earlier in July to see all the great things that we're doing at the port and also look at some of our infrastructure needs statewide. Recently, we brought in four massive new cranes to, to double our capacity to handle a deep water berth. The Port of Baltimore is Maryland's port. Right here in Howard County, WR Grace, uh, Metri, uh, Baltimore Distribution, and Elite Spice all ship their products through the Port of Baltimore. More than, for more than a year, the Motor Vehicle Administration has operated under an appointment only um, environment. And I feel like that has gone well. We needed to do it to promote the safety and health of our customers. During that time, the agency has significantly expanded its online services through our innovative Customer Connect system. As a result, the MVA is now serving more customers online than ever before and serving more people overall than it did pre-pandemic. I'm proud of the role that our Maryland Transit Administration has played in making sure our essential workers throughout this pandemic could perform their critical duties. Today's ridership across the MTA core services remains pretty consistent, and MTA continues to ensure that bus and rail services remain safe and reliable. We're getting close to about 70% of pre-pandemic ridership on our core bus system, while the other modes of light rail and metro and MART continue to kind of recover a little bit slower. We did recently resume full service schedule on MARC and commuter bus, as many riders are uh, re reducing their teleworking and returning to work on site. 
Shifting over to the CTP, you'll find uh, I am pleased to announce that our draft CTP is approximately $16.4 billion. That's over a billion dollars more than the six-year capital program passed last year. And it's on par with the $16.4 billion program passed in 2019 to 24. The final 21 to 26 CTP was about $15.2 billion. The largest drivers of this increase include an influx of COVID relief funds of about $841 million and revenue changes of about $488 million. The largest components of that are our motor fuel tax and our titling fees. The CTP focuses heavily on system preservation, delivering major projects, and planning and engineering investments for the future. Just as important, this CTP will allow our transportation system to contribute to Maryland's economic recovery. More than half of our budget in the CTP, $8.2 million, is going directly into system preservation or state of good repair. Our infrastructure needs it. This funding is critical to bring bridges, rail, port, airport facilities, and other infrastructure into that state of good repair. This draft CTP also allows us to move forward with major projects across the state, the Howard Street Tunnel, the AB connector at the BWI International Thurgood Marshall Airport, the I-695-70 triple bridges, the I-695 traffic relief plan, the Purple Line, and the replacement of the American Legion Bridge. Last, but certainly not least, we're investing in planning and engineering to build that shelf of projects that will benefit residents and businesses in the future generations. Those planning and engineering projects cover every region and mode of travel across the state. At SHA, uh, it advances a new interchange at 495 and 95 and, and the Greenbelt Metro Station and improvements on 197 in Bowie and Prince George's County. It's investments in US 15 and Frederick County, some of our critical bridges across the state like the Maryland 90 Bridge in Ocean City and investments in US 219 in Garrett County. Over at MTA, we're studying two new transit corridors in the Baltimore region and we're now advancing the Mark Penn Camden connector. Over at MTA, we're also investing in the redevelopment of our Eastern bus facility, including charging for, ex charging for our expanded electric vehicle fleet. Over at MAA, our expansion of the electric shuttle bus fleet, and then over at MPA, significant investments in dredge replacement material and, and work so that we can continue to accommodate the largest ships in the world. Secretary Slater, could I just have you pause right there for a second for our interpreter? I really apologize for this. Sure. If, the, if our interpreter could identify herself again for a few, few seconds. Interpreter. Sorry, Secretary, thank you. Sure, no problem. Looking ahead, we believe we've weathered the worst of this COVID revenue impact and expect most revenues to return to pre-pandemic levels by 2023. Our federal COVID relief packages are helping us bridge the gap until then, but they will almost be entirely depleted by 2024. Beyond FY23, our revenue growth is expected to be a little bit slower with no expected state revenue increases during that six year period. With some of the uncertainty in mind, our teams are focused on stretching every dollar to maximize value on the system and for our customers. Our infrastructure needs statewide are significant. The reality is that we have a significant state of good repair backlog throughout the state, currently in excess of about $7 billion when you look across all modes. Much of our infrastructure was built decades ago so we need to repair and replace many significant assets like bridges and tunnels all at the same time. While we're also working to address that passenger bottleneck and critical operational need at the Baltimore, in Baltimore with our new BMP tunnel, recently renamed the Frederick Douglass Tunnel, uh, we are still facing an additional $2 billion in other state of good repair needs on our transit network. So transit is not alone. We have a $4 billion backlog on our highway network another $750 million backlog in our two main airports, BWI, Marshall, and uh, Martin State Airport. Uh, we continue to invest in state of good repair. When you look at the whole system, it's really in need of modernization. With smart infrastructure, adaptable and integrated solutions, and safer urbanized roadways with more transit options. This includes supporting the deployment of electric vehicles, the network is fast and a network of fast and reliable charges needed to refuel them. Maryland currently has about 36,000 electric vehicles registered in the state and more than 1,000 charging stations with 2,700 charger outlets. We're also studying two new transit corridors in the Baltimore area, an east-west transit route between Bayview through downtown Baltimore to Greater Ellicott City and Howard County, 
and then a north-south route between Towson and Baltimore County and downtown Baltimore. The regional transit plan east-west corridor underway is now looking at different alignments and alternatives as part of this study. This includes bus rapid transit, metro subway, light rail. Finally, we're fulfilling our funding commitments to the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority by providing $2.7 billion in the CTP. As you can tell, when we think about our priorities, state of good repair investments are a top priority for us. We will continue to do that and continue to focus on that. But we're also gonna continue on a, a variety of other things while we do that. Building intelligence across our assets, delivering those infrastructure projects in a way that incorporates technology and flexibility and future growth, providing those safe and accessible mobility choices for all users, including pedestrians and bicyclists, solutions that consider relationships and opportunities that exist between land use and transportation decisions, establishing a sustainable customer-focused transportation vision that incorporates roadway, transit, freight, air, and port infrastructure. This vision will set the foundation for our budgets for years to come. Shifting over to the federal side, a big part of how we deliver that vision will involve continued and additional investment from our federal partners. As I'm sure you've heard, Maryland has received significant funding from the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, and the American Recovery, uh, sorry, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. Numerous projects across the state will benefit from ARPA funding, including the expansion of Masonville, Cox Creek, and Popper Island dredge material containment sites at the Port of Baltimore, new zero emission buses for MTA, and permanent branch coverings over at the MBA to cover our customers while they're waiting uh, for their appointment. We're closely tracking the actions in DC. I'm tracking them every single day and our teams are ready to deploy those resources as soon as that funding is passed and help strengthen our system. In closing, I do wanna take the time to, to thank you again for having us here, but also to announce uh, one of our key projects in the secretary's budget. The Bikeways grants made possible through MDOT's Kim Lempier's Bikeways Network Program. Today, we announced about $3.38 million in FY22 grants to support bike safety and access improvements for projects across the state, including $1.1 million grant in Howard County that the governor announced early this week. This grant is gonna fund design and a shared use path of a shared use path along Ten Oaks Road and Guilford Road and Maryland 108 Clarksville Pike. When completed, these paths will extend Columbia's path network to businesses along Clarksville Pike and across Maryland 32, increasing bike opportunities and providing expanded transportation options for residents. The county will also receive another $63,500 grant through a recreational trails program for the old Ellicott City Connector. This project is in conjunction with the Friends of Patapsco Valley State Park and will result in a two mile natural surface trail connecting the Hollowfield area of Patapsco Valley State Park to the Sylvan Lane in uh, Ellicott City along with a trailhead kiosk and trail markers. We're highlighting these grants and other bike and pedestrian initiatives in our Walk Cycle Maryland uh, social media pages. At this point, I wanna thank you again and turn it over uh, to our administrators, starting with our, our State Highway Administration uh, with Tim Smith. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, good evening, County Executive Calvin Ball and County Council members. As the Secretary mentioned, I'm Tim Smith. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight and an honor to lead the State Highway team. So last year, our SHA team focused maintaining our existing construction and maintenance program by working uh, straight through the pandemic with following proper health practices. That focus allowed us to continue to deliver a lot of important projects. Uh, and it's several of those great examples of those include right here in Howard County. So I know the county exec mentioned it, but the dualization of Maryland 32 between Linden Church Road and I-70 so that construction of that project continues to advance, and uh, that's a $127 million contract that we are approximately 75% done with an anticipated completion date of, of next summer, summer of 2022. Also along the Maryland 32 corridor, uh, and we've worked together with Howard County to identify some uh, new north-south bicycle routes, as the secretary mentioned, and as, as well as the county exec. So we're investing roughly $900,000 to address pinch points along 10 Oaks Road to ensure we can accommodate cyclists between Burnt Woods and Brighton Dam Road. So that design is underway. Uh, construction will follow in 2024. This project will dovetail into the $1.1 million bikeways grant that the secretary just mentioned. 
and design a shared use path uh, along Ten Oaks Road from Brighton Dam Road to Maryland 108. In Columbia, uh, we have a project on uh, Maryland 108 there at Centennial Lane. Uh, that project will add uh, a second left eastbound turn lane as well as extend the westbound right turn lane and widen Centennial Lane to allow both uh, to receive two northbound lanes. So in addition to that, there's some bicycle accommodations that will be part of that project. So State Highway funded uh, roughly 2.7 million for design and right of way and acquisition and utilities for that project. The county in their partnership with us funded the 3.9 for construction. So construction is underway and we're anticipating to complete that project next summer. In Ellicott City, we're widening Maryland 103 from US 29 to Longgate Shopping Center. This project uh, will provide auxiliary lanes, uh, extend lanes uh, to match uh, roadway improvements being done by others, and we'll also install sidewalks and bicycle compatible shoulders uh, in, both, in both approaches. So that construction project is uh, $13 million and will begin, anticipated to begin this fall. I'm sorry, anticipated to begin next fall, fall of 2022 and will be completed in the summer of 2023. So as our current CTP budget draws closer to pre-pandemic levels, as the secretary mentioned, we can shift some resources to building a shelf for projects in anticipation of the potential federal infrastructure funding. So at State Highway, we're focusing on shelf projects that kind of meet three main categories, uh, one being asset management, two being accessibility, and three being mobility. So Projects in asset, in, with an asset management approach are geared to provide a sound transportation infrastructure for the next generation by making kind of the best decisions we can now using a, a long-term mindset. When I'm referring to accessibility projects, those are really for our vulnerable users like pedestrians, bicyclists, uh, those on scooters, as well as our motorists to connect them to life's opportunities. So when the secretary, uh, when Secretary Slater was in my seat uh, in 2019, we introduced kind of a, a new approach, uh, SHA's context-driven guide. So what that guide really does, is it builds flexibility into our planning concepts and design solutions to address major issues in safety and accessibility for like, those vulnerable users I just mentioned, but while still considering the transportation needs for all our motors. So this is a bit of a culture shift for State Highway, as well as the entire um, uh, Maryland roadway industry from the engineering and, and planning side. So we're on the learning curve right now as we rebuild our shelf of projects, but we know improving our procedures uh, through the lens of the context guide and with a, a vision zero goal will make our roadways uh, safer for everyone. Mobility projects are really about utilizing the existing footprint and available technology to deliver uh, what Greg kind of mentioned, the smart or intelligent systems that maximize the efficiency of our highway infrastructure. So in closing, as we kind of navigate through these mentally uh, and physical, uh, fiscally, I should say, fiscally challenging uh, ch uh, times, SHA will continue to work collaboratively with our stakeholders and maintain a safer and more reliable, transparent um, system for our Marylanders. So part of that fiscal responsibility is ensuring our agency is using our internal resources in the most efficient manner possible. So at S SHA, we're, we're examining currently uh, opportunities for our business processes to make adjustments and as well as to actively um, modify our workflows to ensure our core functions support our mission in the most effective way. So I thank you for your time and I will turn it over to our teammate at MDTA, uh, Melissa Williams. And Melissa, before you start, I'm going to pause again if we could pause between each one of the uh, speakers for our interpreter. Hi, this is the ASL interpreter. Okay, just make the chart. Um, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Bruce. This past year, the MDTA made progress in preserving Maryland's toll facilities and developing projects and studies to serve Marylanders into the future. Work continues on the $1.1 billion I-95 Express Toll Lanes Northbound Extension Program to relieve congestion and improve travel along the I-95 corridor in Harford County. Construction began in May on the major project to widen northbound 95 between Maryland 43 and Maryland 152 to make way for extension, the extension of two northbound express toll lanes. The extension is expected to open to traffic by 2024 to Maryland 152, with the full extension to north of Maryland 24 open to traffic by 2027. In February, 
the Tier 1 Draft Environmental Impact Statement for the ongoing Chesapeake Bay Crossing Study was made available for public review and comment at baycrossingstudy.com. The MDTA held in-person and virtual public hearings in April, and the comment period ended in May. We expect to identify a selected corridor alternative and publish a combined final environmental impact statement record of decision in the winter of 2021-2022. The MDTA implemented temporary all-electronic tolling statewide in March of 2020 as part of its COVID-19 response, and we made all-electronic tolling permanent in August of 2020. Construction for highway speed all-electronic tolling and on new gantries and the removal or partial removal of the existing toll plazas is underway at the Fort McHenry Tunnel, JFK Memorial Highway, and the Nice Middleton Bridge. Study is underway for the I-895 Baltimore Harbor Tunnel toll plaza and interchange improvements, which will allow MDTA to bring highway speed all electronic tolling to the Harbor Tunnel. The MDTA launched Drive Easy MD, the home for all things tolling in Maryland. The April launch of Drive Easy MD included a new website, web chat, customer call center with expanded hours, text notifications, and more. Customers can now pay their Maryland tolls with Easy Pass pay by plate as well as video tolling. Easy Pass Maryland customers continue to receive the lowest toll rates with savings up to 77%. More features such as additional vehicle classes with lower toll rates and a mobile app are coming soon. Last December, we reopened the newly constructed I-895 bridges north of Baltimore Harbor Tunnel two months early. The new northbound and southbound I-895 structures replaced MDTA's only structurally deficient bridges in its inventory. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Holly Arnold at MTA. Thanks, Melissa. I will give it a minute for the ASL interpreter to get back up there. Hi, thank you. Thanks. Uh, so thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Holly Arnold. I'm the acting administrator for MTA. Uh, MTA is one of the largest multimodal uh, transit systems in the U.S. Uh, we operate local bus and commuter bus, as well as light rail, metro, subway, uh, mark train service, uh, comprehensive mobility paratransit system, and we support the locally operated transit systems across the state. Our agency's goal is to provide safe, efficient, and reliable transit service across Maryland with world-class customer service. The COVID-19 health crisis highlighted the critical role that transit plays in connecting the region's residents to employment, healthcare, education, and other essential services. And I'm really happy to report that as of August 30th, all modes have resumed full scheduled service. MTA continues to make significant capital investments in state of good repair projects to ensure that our system remains a safe and reliable transportation option for the entire region. Federal relief funding from the, the CARES Act, CRISA, and ARPA have filled some operating funding gaps and have allowed us to advance a, new, a number of state of good repair needs. Uh, these include over $400 million to replace our metro subway rail cars and signal system, $160 million to overhaul major systems on our light rail trains to ensure reliable service, $54 million to overhaul 63 Mark III passenger coaches, $210 million for a five-year contract for clean diesel buses, and significant investments in our metro and light rail system, including $238 million dedicated to rehabilitation for metro tunnel track systems and stations, and $264 million for repairing and rehabbing light rail structures, track systems, and stations. While we do continue to prioritize funding for state of good repair across all of our modes, with a particular focus on our older assets, we're also preparing for the future of transit. Uh, recently, we published the agency's strategic plan for the next five years, titled Rebuilding Better, Committed to an Equitable Transit Future, the plan will guide our recovery from COVID-19 and identifies priorities for us to create a brighter future for transit by focusing on technology, communication, and collaboration with equity as a central focus. These commitments build upon the strong foundation of progress uh, MTA has established to improve the transit system and experience uh, and system reliability for our riders, including our recognition as the safest transit system in the U.S. for the past seven years implementation of charm pass mobile ticketing, 
improving our bus reliability through dedicated bus lanes and expanding our real time information to mark train and commuter bus. The full plan is available on our website for review. In addition to the strategic plan, we're undertaking a number of projects to advance the agency. This includes the Mark Riverside Heavy Maintenance Facility that is currently under construction in Baltimore. Uh, this is a $65 million facility uh, that will be state of the art, enabling us to enhance our locomotive and rail car maintenance capabilities and will help support major transit infrastructure investments along the North Beach Corridor. Uh, additionally, in May of this year, we announced as part of the Regional Transit Plan implementation the launch of two RTP corridor feasibility studies. Uh, the corridors show strong demand for transit and are really opportunities for us to explore new transportation modes, schedules, routes, and infrastructure. We're currently studying a north-south corridor between Towson and downtown Baltimore and an east-west corridor between the Bayview community and Ellicott City. Uh, we look forward to continuing implementation efforts and uh, moving forward on all of the 30 strategies identified in the five-year RTP action plan, of which over 20 are underway this year. Uh, to learn more and to view the progress dashboard, I encourage everyone to visit rtp.mta.maryland.gov. NTA is also undertaking the, the first 50-year statewide transit plan. Uh, we're really excited about this, and the draft plan is, excited, is expected to be available for public comment by the end of this year. Uh, building upon regional and local transit plans existing across the state, uh, this is going to outline a 50-year vision for transit in Maryland to help define transit needs across the state for future generations. We look forward to working with Howard County and other stakeholders across the state to develop this vision and framework for coordinated transit service in Maryland. As ridership continues to grow and travel patterns change, MTA remains consistent in our unwavering commitment to our riders. Uh, as part of this, uh, this CTP dedicates $43 million to transit network improvements to improve the customer experience. Uh, these include funds for uh, new dedicated bus lanes, bus stops and transit hubs, including AADA improvements, wayfinding and bike and shared mobility. Uh, these investments demonstrate our priorities to accelerate rider focus initiatives and projects that provide meaningful benefits to the communities that we serve. MT is also committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and is aggressively transitioning towards a zero emission bus fleet, uh, investing in over 269 million for our zero emission vehicles program, bus pilots, and bus procurements. We also make a significant investment in transit in Howard County by providing nearly 2.8 million in operating capital grants to support the county's local transit operation. Uh, and in response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, Howard County will receive nearly $16 million in federal relief funds to support transit operations and capital needs for the county. Thank you. I will now turn it over to Christy Neiser at MDA. Thank you, Holly. It looks like we're good with the interpreter, just want to check. Are you started? Great. Well, thank you for having me here today. At, at M.MBA, we remain focused on providing that premier customer service, both if you come to visit us in person, as well as if you perform those services remotely online. We remain appointment only, but as the Secretary outlined, that has allowed us to serve actually more customers more efficiently. Most branch offices have returned to that pre-pandemic level, and in many cases, we're actually exceeding the levels that we were customers that we were seeing prior to the pandemic. Online and kiosk services also remain a really vital part of providing products to Marylanders statewide. And as the Secretary outlined, those have increased because of the additional services we now offer online through Customer Connect. We've also taken the opportunity during COVID to re-examine the services that we provide to Maryland residents to figure out how can we can do some things more efficiently. And I really want to thank the legislature for their support and some of the changes that we needed to make to existing law. For example, you used to only be able to renew your license six months in advance of the expiration date on the product. Now you can do that 12 months in advance. So that'll help our students, individuals who might be out of state during that period of time, even living overseas with some of the military. So a lot of great benefits there. Also, in terms of that new photo, you're probably familiar that you needed to get a photo every other renewal cycle, so every eight years. Um, individuals sometimes have to come in because they lose their license or they need to correct that address. They get a photo taken at that time, but they were never able to use that for the next renewal. Because of the change in law, they'll now be able to renew that. So that means more people will be able to take advantage of our online renewal process. We also extended the vision certification. You probably know that if you're over 40, you do have to have that every renewal period, um, even if you're doing it remotely. 
And so that used to be a one-year cycle. If you went to your eye doctor and got that certified, now that certification is good for two years. So again, allowing more people to do services online. We have offered more services than ever before with the implementation of our Customer Connect system from March to August of this year. We saw an increase of 45% in online transactions compared to that same period in 2019. Those services are only gonna be further enhanced with the final rollout of our IT modernization that we call Customer Connect. That'll go live in early December. Um, phase one, which was our vehicle and business licensing system was completed in July of last year. Phase two includes our driver services, as well as driver enforcement, investigations, and financial services, and really allows us to have that 360 view of the customer we've always wanted to serve them in the best way possible. It consolidates all our IT systems into that single portal. It allows for real-time updates and really allows the customer to take advantage of doing more things online and taking advantage of the services that are there. We're also implementing something we're calling Maryland ID. Currently, you might have heard of a SoundX or a driver's license number that's on your product. That is an algorithm made up of your last name and date of birth, and not as secure as we'd like to be, especially in, in a day where we know that number is used for many purposes. So under Customer Connect, starting in December, everybody who's issued a product will get that new Maryland ID number, which is generated randomly and will stay with you during your life of, as a Maryland resident. And so we're excited about the efficiencies as well as the securities that brings us. For our CDL customers, the expiration dates on all their products will now be eight years. Previously, non-commercial customers enjoyed that benefit, but for our commercial customers, they expired every five years. And so that'll um, you know, spread out the time when they have to come back and complete that renewal. We are still moving forward with our real ID process. Um, as you may have heard, that deadline was moved back to May 3rd of 2023. So that allows more of our Maryland residents to be able to come in during their normal renewal cycle and provide the documents that are required for real ID. I am really proud to say we're up to 82% of Maryland residents who are now real ID compliant, which is really one of the highest in the nation and something that we should all be proud of. We also remain really committed to saving lives on our roadways and certainly appreciate the comments by an executive ball about that. Um, last year, you know, we had the highest summer roadway fatality since 20, 2008. And um, you know, that's when traffic volume was down as much as 50% at the height of the pandemic. We continue to see that really dangerous driving behavior. And unfortunately, even though traffic is returning as we heard to those pre-pandemic levels, the speed is staying high and those dangerous behaviors continue to be seen out there. Um, last week, Governor Hogan did announce 550,000 for organizations and law enforcement agencies in Howard County to address highway safety. Um, I also wanna commend Howard County for their efforts in working on a local strategic highway safety plan. We really do think that's an important component working together with a statewide plan to help save lives on our roadways. We also continue to push our new overarching safety campaign called Be the Driver, which focuses that every time you get them behind the wheel as a driver, it's really your responsibility to make sure that you're looking out for everybody in the vehicle, looking out for everybody on the roadway. That obviously includes our bicyclists and our pedestrians. We do strive to be the best we can in everything we can do, whether it's highway safety or customer service, but I have to say it all comes back to our employees. Despite the very challenging times we've all been through in the last few years, they've continued to deliver that premier customer service, showing up every day, making sure Maryland residents have the critical services that they need. And I'm so grateful for the job that they do every day. With that, I'd like to thank you again for allowing me to speak and I'll now turn it over to Ricky Smith, the Executive Director of the Maryland Aviation Administration. Give the interpreter a chance to get set. I think we're ready. Uh, thank you, Christy. Christy, throughout the pandemic, we've collaborated with the state, federal leaders, public health officials, and other partners to ensure safe, healthy airports for our customers and employees at BWI Thurgood Marshall Airport, as well as Martin State Airport. Our airport communities remain focused on providing healthy and safe travel. The strong recovery that we have experienced reflects the confidence that our customers feel with the safe, comfortable travel services they receive. In fact, the recovery at BWI Marshall Airport leads the region with growing passenger traffic and new airline service. 
I am particularly proud of the work for my employees during the pandemic and the fact that BWI Marshall was named the best airport in North America in its size category by the Airport Council Internet, excuse me, Airport Council International in the 2020 Airport Service Quality Awards Program. This ASQ program recognizes global airports for delivery of best customer services measured by passengers. To receive this honor during the pandemic, the most challenging time in our history was a remarkable achievement. Throughout the pandemic, we continue to innovate and provide new services and amenities for our passengers. Like the $48 million five gate extension of Concourse A, that offers new food and retail concessions, upgraded restrooms, and more capacity for Southwest Airlines, and our new state-of-the-art electric vehicle charging stations, which are an important collaboration with BGE to boost charging infrastructure in our region. Moving forward, our capital program remains focused on improving facilities and services for our customers while creating opportunities for domestic and international air service. System preservation and resiliency are major focal points for MAA's capital program. Driven by the need to provide exceptional service to our customers in the safest, most reliable, and efficient manner, system preservation projects include an airport-wide restroom renovation program, aviation fuel storage replacement and expansion, electrical feeder replacements, air fuel lighting vault upgrades, and passenger boarding bridge replacements. Additionally, as a designated general aviation reliever to BWR Marshall, improving facilities at Martin State Airport remains a key component to maintaining an efficient regional aviation system that balances the needs of commercial, corporate, personal, emergency response, and military aircraft operations. After a short pause due to the pandemic, we're moving forward with a major multi-year terminal improvement to the center of operations for Southwest Airlines, the largest airline partner at BW Marshall. The Concourse AB Connector and Baggage Handling System project will transform a major portion of the airport, creating an enhanced travel experience for passengers and supporting the future growth of Southwest. The improvements will include direct concourse to concourse connectivity for passengers, new food and retail concessions, modern restrooms, and expanded airline hold rooms, all sitting atop a new sophisticated baggage handling system. This large scale project will be largely funded by airport revenue bonds, which were issued for the first time ever this past summer. The bond issuance was well received by rating agencies and investors alike. We also are moving forward on major site preparation and utility work that will support construction of a major aircraft maintenance facility for Southwest Airlines, the first such maintenance hangar in Northeast, in the Northeast for the carrier. MAA will continue to support aviation and airports across Maryland by working with our 35 public use airports in the state. For the statewide aviation grants program, uh, thanks to Secretary Slater, that provides important state funding and support for airport improvement projects, MAA um, intends to administer over $1.6 million in grants during the fiscal year 2022 for regional airports across the state of Maryland. As the global aviation industry continues to recover and rebound, across MAA, we are working to provide excellent service for our customers. We remain committed to excellent service and convenience for our customers at BWI Marshall and Martin State Airport. With that, let me turn it back to Secretary Greg Slater. Thank you so much, Ricky, and thank you to the whole team for the great updates. Uh, but thank you to the county for the opportunity to discuss our six-year budget. Uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it back over uh, to you, uh, Bruce, and, and County Executive Ball, and we're happy to answer any questions that you may have on our program. Thank you, uh, Secretary Slater. I, I think I'll um, start off with uh, rewarding the elected officials who have uh, stayed on camera for this whole time. So um, starting off with our state elected officials, I'll ask uh, Delegate Watson if you have any questions for MDOT or the county. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I, I wanted to 
basically say thank you to everyone who's on the call, the um, all of the state staff, Secretary Slater, um, in particular, Terry Seuss and Christy Neiser do a lot of good work for us. And we appreciate we appreciate them working through tedious problems. The work that you all did on um, North Ridge Road or South Ridge Road by the post office is really working out much better than you would expect looking at the grid on the roadway. Um, doesn't make sense that it would actually work, but it does. <laughs> so we appreciate the work that you've done there. I am curious of, about Route 70 and wondering if, um, if you have any information about the stretch of Route 70 in Howard County and how that compares to other interstate highway uh, segments from a safety perspective. Let me let me start on this, and then I'll turn it over to Administrator Tim Smith. And you, know, from a from a safety perspective, I think a lot of the safety challenges uh, that we see on on Interstate 70, and I, and I don't know that they stand out as being you know, super super significant. But ones that ones that we have are uh, really associated with a lot of truck movements, but also um, congestion related areas. So we have. Uh, some challenges where really where 70 kind of dead ends into uh, the Beltway and that kind of north section in Baltimore County. And then, of course, 70 near 29 is a, is a heavily congested area that, that I know Tim and his team are really focused on with some innovative solutions. And then, you know, it gets again when you get further south. But, um, you know, our, our, our safety issues along I-70 from, from my memory have been really focused on either trucks or, or significant speed issues. Tim, you want to expand on that a little bit? Yeah, thanks. I'd be happy to. So uh, I think the, the, the really the safety issue on 70 is more a congestion based safety issue, meaning when it gets congested, uh, we have a lot of rear ends. And um, as, as the secretary mentioned, when we do have tractor trailer issues, it's usually uh, uh, either um, speed related or um, speed related in, in the sense of folks maybe not being as gentle as they need to be around tractor trailers. <laughs> and what I think what we have is a, a potential ultimate solution there is we would like to look at the the entire system there, the the US 29, the the I-70, the Maryland 99, US 29 all, and US 40 all together there as a system. I think there's opportunities there where we can use the existing infrastructure and basically uh, use some intelligent transportation systems, uh, meaning cameras and, and queue detections, uh, and potentially uh, using some of the shoulders on I-70, uh, hard shoulder running shoulders, um, to alleviate some of that congestion. And that coupled with using technology and, and smart devices be able to not only improve congestion, but more importantly, improve the safety concerns. Does that uh, make sense? So, yes, so, you, so you are, you're focused on that and, and um, hopefully we'll, be able to make some changes there, but as as we you mentioned, twenty nine and seventy, the interchange specifically. Um, what else can we do there? I, I, you know, in terms of maybe more uh, modest improvements, what can we do to help that intersection, in that area, improve and improve traffic flow? So, is your is your concern with congestion or safety or both? Well, I just switched on you <laughs> okay. to to basically, you know, congestion around that interchange as opposed to that strip of 70. We were talking about the safety. I was wondering how it compared to other um, state highway segments, but you mentioned the interchange. So regarding the interchange, is there more we can do and and how extensive are the solutions for that? So. That's kind of where, I, I, you know, Secretary Slater mentioned it, and I was trying to tee it up a little bit, but to give you a little sneak peek, if we if we are able to have that federal infrastructure bill, that is one of our top priorities to kind of address that entire system. Um, and I think between, like I said, between using intelligent transportation systems, potentially using some hard shoulder running on both 70 and, and other locations where it makes sense, we need to get further into the design and finish, flush out some of those concepts. I think we can improve congestion throughout that. It's we're considered an entire system because when you have an incident on 70, it instantly uh, overflows onto 40 and 99 and US 29. So we we need to see view that as an entire system, and that's how we're designing the solution. Uh, so th they're all integrated. I think if you fix, uh, you can't just fix necessarily one part of it. You need to fix it as an entire system to really improve the entire region. But I. I, I 
we have a solution. We just need some, we need some federal dollars to kind of help us out there. And I think, uh, it, it, at least I'm holding up hope that that's going to be coming forward for us. I hope so too. Um, I guess we'll, we'll stand by and, and see if that happens and go from there to, to learn more about exactly what that would entail. Okay. Sounds great. That is it, it for me. You can move on to some of the other. Okay, um, I, I did note that um, we do have a uh, Senator Lamb on on the line. He was able to to join us. So, Senator, if you have any uh, comments or questions, yeah, um, thank you, and thanks to all the um, MDOT um, representatives who are here with us on this. Um, uh, and I appreciate the um, presentation from from Mr. Smith earlier from MAA. I know this has been an issue for a lot of our constituents in the past, uh, particularly when it comes to the uh continued airplane noise from uh bwi airport i know we have an ongoing uh effort to study some of the health effects of the noise that's coming from the air traffic that's overhead in columbia we still continue to hear a lot of concerns from our constituents so um I do appreciate the continued um, effort to be able to work on you with the study so i know um i think you know, we had meetings earlier in the year to be able to kind of get that off the ground. And I think that's still continuing on. I think 1 thing I did want to touch on, um. Was, uh, you know, we, we do hear obviously about the potential for a federal infrastructure package and. Um, from the presentations earlier, it seems like there's been a lot of attention being given to, um. The need for projects down in the DC Beltway along the American Legion Bridge, 270 corridor, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, we obviously have a lot of constituents that do travel down to um, DC, but also to Baltimore. And um, I am concerned that um, if this infrastructure package were to pass, that um, you know, I want to make sure that there are good amount of dollars that are coming to Howard County to be able to support. Um, our transportation needs as well. We are, we do have a lot of folks that commute both in both directions. And while the improvements around the DC beltway are important, um, you know, there's still that stretch to be able to get from here down to, um, those projects for, uh, those constituents that are traveling in that direction. And so, um, you know, is there any reassurance that you can give us? Um, and, um, you know, I think I know I've brought this up in the past, but to, um, the effect of uh, the level of funding that would be able to come back to support local projects here in Howard County, particularly if those federal dollars come through. Um, you know, I think uh, it's really important to a lot of our constituents. Sure, sure, absolutely, Senator Lamb. Good to see you. Let me just kind of address it from a couple of different layers. You know, I think first and foremost, when those federal dollars, when and if those federal dollars are passed, our focus has to kind of first be on this kind of system preservation function of. Kind of investing in that state of good repair, I would envision, you know, at least half of that money kind of focused on that backlog of state of good repair, somewhat limited by how much industry can deliver and those types of things. But thinking about Howard County and some potential infra investments there that could really help us that, that are really near the top of our list. You know, Tim had touched a little bit on the, the Interstate 70 kind of 2999 package, but we also have. Uh, investments. We have a federal grant in right now uh, that we're really hopeful on for the East West Carter construction. That's miles and miles of new dedicated busway that's going to head out to Ellicott City all the way over in Hopkins and, and provide kind of high frequency transit service as well as really first class bus stops and those types of things. So it's, it's really kind of our first endeavor and one of those kind of high frequency uh, routes with a lot of those features. The other piece that uh, I don't want to lose sight of in the federal infrastructure bill is, you know, there's the infrastructure money that comes to the state, but then there's the infrastructure money that goes to other entities. And so the one investment I'll highlight there is uh, the BMP tunnel with the money flowing for, towards Amtrak. And so the BMP tunnel, it's now named the Frederick Douglass tunnel, tunnel is, a, is a rail tunnel just outside of Penn Station that we have significant delays and speed restrictions with. And once we're able to address that tunnel with Amtrak, that creates the opportunity to have high frequency uh, mark rail service from Penn Station to Union Station, creating a 30 minute commute trip from Penn Station to Union Station kind of on a, on a regular basis. So it expands a lot of accessibility through the region and certainly would go right through uh, your region as well, coming down that, that kind of track there. But, but absolutely, we are, are focused on making sure that 
One, we're investing in state of good repair, but two, uh, looking at how we can invest in all parts of the state. And And uh, I was muted. Sec <laughs> uh, thank you, Secretary. Oh, go ahead, Ms. Smith. Um, um, if I can um, just follow up on sure. your point about noise at the airport. Um, I know it's an important issue to you. With respect to the, um, the study, uh, the Secretary's office has contracted with the University of Maryland, Baltimore County to conduct that study. Um, that work is underway. Um, MAA is not directly involved in that study, we will provide uh, whatever um, expertise or advisory support that's, that's, um, that's needed, but um, we're not actively involved in the study because we want to, um, we want the study to be objective and we do not want to um, influence the outcome of the study. We think it's an important um, study. Uh, and so that is underway and, um, and that should be completed um, in due time. I don't think we could pick a better, um, school to partner with the UMBC for, for that important study. Uh, with respect to um, the community's work to try and mitigate the impact of aircraft noise, I think we have a very good news story there. I mean, the community really did come together um, and brought its expertise, partnered with um, MAA, um, Southwest Airlines, and other partners in the industry to, um, to develop a recommendation, a series of recommendations that were um, forwarded to the FAA um, nearly a year ago um, for consideration to try to correct or mitigate the impact of noise that quite frankly resulted from the next gen changes that the FAA made without, in our minds, sufficient public input. The FAA is now going through what it calls its um, PBN process or performance based navigation process where they will evaluate the recommendations from the community. Uh, they will either approve the recommendations um, in whole or some version of the modifications, but whatever they do, uh, their approval, their flight, their, their um, approved um, changes to the flight path will then have to go through an environmental assessment process where the public will have uh, another bite at the apple. The public will then be able to um, to comment, to voice its, um, its concerns or its support for the changes that will be approved out of that PBM process. And so um, um, the way the community came together to develop those recommendations is, is a model for the rest of the country. Um, we think the rest of the country is paying attention to what we've done. And so we have, just have to work with the FAA now to make sure that they, um, the version that they approve is as close to the recommendations um, as possible. Right, thank you. Um, and and do I do recognize that the study is being done? It's actually being done by UMB, I believe, out of the School of Pharmacy, and so it is being done independently, which I think is is a good point that um, you make as well and point out. Um, I think where where MA has been helpful, and I think I hope will continue to be helpful, is providing some of the raw data that's needed for uh, the study. Um, researchers to be able to do their work. And so I know, I think that's where we had meetings earlier, I guess it was last year now, to uh, figure out how to be able to um, get them that information from MAA and appreciate the, the help with being able to do that. Um, you know, I think the, the only thing to point out, and I, I've said this before in, in past meetings like this, is that BWI is a state-owned airport. So unlike many other airports, that are owned um, by a conglomeration or a metropolitan authority, BWI is a state owned airport. And I think our encouragement is for you to use the state's leverage as a state owned airport on FAA to be responsive to these community concerns. Um, because up to this point, I think many of our constituents have expressed frustration that FAA has not been responsive, that the feds have not really um, addressed some of the ongoing concerns that we've heard uh, I guess literally heard out of BWI. So, um, you know, encourage you to to take that into consideration. And uh, for Secretary Slater, appreciate the the comments. I think the the only thing I want to highlight too is, and this is a perennial kind of um, uh, issue with us, is the need for increased support for um, mass transit, and that includes projects like the Flash. Uh, uh, extension project coming out of Montgomery County and bus rapid transit. I think it's a useful 
um, means for many of our residents to be able to get down towards uh, Montgomery County into DC. Um, but that's a project that does need support and um, would be from our, uh, from my perspective, at least worthwhile considering for additional resources to be able to sustain and continue. So uh, just wanted to make a plug for that as well. Great, thank you so much. I worked on that project when I was in a planning director seat many years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lamb. Um, I would note that um, we were told by MAA that that meeting with the FAA was uh, trying to be uh, scheduled for early November, first week of, of November. So there's hope there. Um, also want to note that the county executive has provided the BWI community roundtable with uh, some consultant support to, to work closely with MAA um, so that we can be even more collaborative in the future. And Anne Arundel um, appears to be getting on board with that as well and helping provide funding for that. So um, thank you for that. Um, I'll put that, I'll um, move on. I, I think I want to have the interpreter refresh so you can um, come to the top of the list again, if you could. Hi, this is the ASL interpreter. Thank you. And uh, Delegate Feldmark, do um, you have any uh, yes. comments, questions? Yes, thank you. Um, good evening and, and thank you all for, for being here to, to talk with us tonight and for, for all the work you do. Um, I want to start off uh, just, I really appreciated um, Administrator Smith's comments about the sort of culture shift um, around uh, really thinking more inclusively about all road users and want to thank Secretary Slater uh, for your leadership on that as well. Um, I think that is, you know, culture shift in any uh, large organization or agency is is tough, but it is so critical. So I'm I'm really uh, appreciative that you're you're taking on that work. Um, and I guess, you know, toward that end, as we think about projects to um, protect vulnerable road users, um, you know, that is an area where we we definitely need more funding, um, particularly in in bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. Um, but we know those dollars are scarce. And so we try to, you know, be as as efficient and strategic as we can. And, and work together and take advantage of opportunities as they present themselves in, in other projects, right? Um, uh, resurfacing and you know, any opportunity. Um, we have had some challenges there. I do want to um, give a shout out to Terry Seuss and her team uh, for uh, you know, making the best of it and coming up uh, with some, some really good uh, solutions when we came to it a little too late in the process, um, but you know, I know everyone's working together to try to, um, you know, get there earlier in the process so we can have better solutions and and deliver it a little more easily. I don't know if there's anything, um, you know, particular that you can uh, recommend or suggest, but I I do think that's that's one priority. Um, I don't know if you want to respond to that. I've got a couple other points too. I do think, you know, and Tim might want to expand a little bit more, but I think, you know, in in kind of reaching out and communicating. Uh, whether it's one particular uh, project or another, we really believe in the context guide that we've that we've developed and in making sure that our engineers and our planners are using that because really what that does in its purest form is start with the land use in that particular community and then from there define the tools that are used in that community. So you know if we're designing a a walkable, bikeable community in a in an urban suburban type area. We don't want to have an interstate tool set there. So we want to make sure that you have the right set of tools and the right set of priorities in each community. And I think as you're advocating, I think that's a really important part of making sure that, that our team is using that context guide as they're developing these projects. Yeah, I guess just to chime in there as well is uh, I, it's really about collaboration, working with the communities as well as uh, those using that particular sections of roadway. Um, and and back to your point, I, I, yeah, I do applaud their district engineer Terry Seuss on that. Is that's kind of back to some of the culture part? Is you know that particular project was focused on uh, you know a, addressing a safety issue related to motorists and resurfacing the roadway. Uh, we had to kind of shoehorn the bicycle and a ped part in that. So the good part about that is as things are coming through design and planning now, they're going through that lens. Where we're going to have this bumpy part is things that had been through that planning and design process prior to the context guide that now we're in construction 
or potentially just about in construction. And we're going to have to make that adjustment. Um, and I, I I think it's really, like I said, it's really about the collaboration and working with the community to make sure it make what what we're putting in makes sense, and uh, ultimately making sure we're we're you know connecting people to life opportunities. That's really what our mission is. Thank you. Um, so then, I also wanted to touch on Mark Service, and I I know um, you spoke earlier a little bit about the uh, improvements to like, the the pen line, right, and and working with with Amtrak. Um, my questions are about CSX and the Camden line. <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm curious, you know, the, the president had an, an executive order um, around sort of the uh, monopolistic uh, controls, right? Um, encouraging the Surface Transportation Board to require mm -hmm. rail owners, um, you know, to allow right of ways for passenger rail. What what opportunities exist in that context for um, for Mark Service on the Camden line, and and what can or should we be doing working together to to really advocate in that new arena? Sure, let me kind of touch on this, and maybe Holly can expand a little bit. You know, you you get into that Camden line; it really is CSX, and you know that's what we've been living and breathing with with our partners in Virginia and Long Bridge and and kind of that ownership side. You know, on the, on the Penn Line, we've been focused on the BMP tunnel and trying to expand there. Uh, the Penn Line, we're making more investments. So we're buying dual locomotives. So we're gonna be running electric locomotives on the Penn Line, but diesel on the, on the Camden Line, just because that's where Amtrak and CSX are very different. So we need to make sure that we can provide service to both. But we're looking at our marketing investment plan and opportunities to, to one, add service, but also kind of maximize our track times and, and look at other infrastructure investments that we have. The other one that, that I think is really important is the Penn Camden connector. And so, you know, the Penn Camden connector is going to allow us to really deliver a better service by providing that bridge over from the Camden line to the Penn line without having to kind of go all the way down, all the way up to kind of make that transfer and create some more efficiencies. But uh, Holly, anything else kind of come into mind as we think about that question? Yeah, I think you you highlighted a lot of it, um, Secretary years later. The the other thing that comes to mind is is we recently um, just had another five year agreement with CSX, uh, and one of the things that we did include in that agreement is the option for us to have them run scenarios for us to improve service. Uh, it sounds really minor, but it's something that didn't exist before. And so now when we go to them, they're actually required to to say yes. Uh, we will run that scenario and get that information for you. Um, We've included improvements on the Camden line in the Central Rail and Regional Transit Plan, and it will be in the upcoming statewide transit plan. It's definitely a priority, uh, and so we're going to continue to to push the SX on allowing us to to make those improvements. Okay. Well, I know um, getting anything new worked into that agreement was a a, a huge lift. So kudos on that. Um, and and my final point is really just um, you know around the Transit Safety and Investment Act. Um, mm -hmm. I was very disappointed in the governor's veto. I am very much looking forward to overriding that veto. And um, and I I guess this is more comment than question, but if you'd like to comment in response, I'm, I'm happy to hear it. Um, I, I hope you all are, are preparing for that and, um, you know, will be ready to hit the ground running in terms of implementation um, because we've, you know, we've already had this uh, this delay from the veto, and so hoping that that you all are anticipating an override, um, even if it wasn't the governor's preference. Sure, I, I will tell you that the the funding levels in this CTP are actually over what was in the the Transit Safety and Investment Act. Uh, the year by year just doesn't match based on cash flows and those types of things. So uh, we, uh, regardless of the veto of that bill, we we made those investments in transit. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, if uh, I don't think we have any other state electeds that um, have questions that we can always come back if there are, but I wanted to uh, acknowledge the council chair, uh, Liz Walsh, to see if she had any comments or questions. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Um, I have, I guess I have one uh, following up on delicate Bellmark's first 
first um, point, and that is um, I actually was very proud of the first draft I saw of our priority letter from um, Bruce Gardner that listed as its number one priority uh, the, um, the funding of four pedestrian safety items on Route 1. Um, that to me, you know, it is certainly important to me as it's in my district, it's in two other council members district. Uh, in our first year, uh, we killed a resident um, in that portion of Route 1 that's in my district. It is, uh, it is important that we, we focus on that. You may note, however, Secretary Slater, that my name is not at the end of this letter. I did not sign this letter as council chair, even though it is customary for the chair to sign it. And it goes to this notion of culture change that I hope you were um, you were speaking to, Mr. Smith, is, um, is so much of what followed that pedestrian safety priority um, was road widening, was increasing, you know, capacity on our roadways and not not spending the dollars on the pedestrian and the safety and the multimodal and the bike paths that so many of our residents want, particularly um, in my part of the county where I have um, US Route 40, I have US Route 1, and even the old historic national road that goes right through Main Street. We cannot safely walk on those portions of road that have been there in some cases for centuries. Um, what, you know, the point where I kind of departed from where Delia Felmark was, was we know the dollars are so scarce or we understand it. I, I don't understand it. Why are dollars so scarce for the pedestrian and the bike pathways and walkways and the safe passages that we want people to be taking if transit's not there, right? How do we move from the customary, you know, 50 years ago, Department of Transportation, and I'm asking this as a civil engineer from Georgia Tech who worked on bridges on my first job out of college, but how do we get away from that mindset and start moving ourselves and our constituents and our investments into things that will have more of a lasting effect, more of a sustainable effect for the next generations that come, you know, centuries after we're, we're gone? How, how, do we, how do we change that? Absolutely, really, really important questions. Let me touch on that. Uh, Tim may want to touch on it as well. And, he, and even Holly may want to touch on it because pedestrian safety around our transit stations and our hubs are, is a really, really important issue. And so you, you hit it with, with a couple of different layers. First of all, you know, I, I look at Route 1. Route 1 is a great example of, of a roadway to really think about in this, in this realm. You know, further down in Prince George's County and College Park, you know, Route 1 is a really, really dense urban environment. You know, you go up further into, into Howard County, you know, you have a little bit of that, but there's a heavy industrial component to that and, and a lot of movement around there. Those roadways were designed 50 years ago for high speed commuter traffic. And now they're seeing a completely different function. So the function of those roadways is very different than it was before. The functional classification of those roadways is very different than it was before. So it's about, it's about rethinking the function of that roadway and you know, if we want to design, uh, you know, higher speed commuter traffic on the interstate system, that's very different than trying to do that on Route One in an area that you're really trying to focus on pedestrian safety. I look at this in, you know, if you think about it, and this is where I get my dry erase board out and kind of walk through the graph on it, but I can't do this on this call. But you know, you look at kind of where you prioritize vehicular movement but then where you prioritize pedestrian and non-motorized and more of our vulnerable system safety, um, you know, they, they, they're very hard to go hand in hand. It's really hard to go to both of those. So you have to make that sacrifice. And so, you know, in these corridors through that context guide, what we're trying to do with this culture shift is look at the function of that roadway, look at that community and then say, okay, this is a roadway where we're going to prioritize the safety of our vulnerable road users and travelers through that region. And that means that we're gonna sacrifice the level of traffic and congestion that's gonna go through there to give safety back to the pedestrians and bicyclists. Sometimes that means narrowing lanes. Sometimes that means uh, like we're working down in uh, Prince George's County where we took away some lanes on a, on a roadway, uh, created some buffers, some, some safer passage for them. And so it's just really about working in the community first and then trying to find the system that works for the community rather than trying to put a system in a community without thinking about what the, the flow is around there. But it really is a big part of our context guide. It's a big part of the culture shift. Um, you know, I, I started it with Tim when, when I was in his seat. Um, I wish I could tell you that, uh, you know, it's a, it's a culture that's going to change overnight. It's, it's just not. 
I, I'm sure you think back when you went to Georgia Tech, you're looking at traffic models and, and where those things were. And, and, and we have our students are just not talking about that. So it's, it's the culture shift has to go beyond just us. We have to make sure that we're making it part of our training programs. We have to reach out to our universities and make it part of the transportation curriculums and just really rethink kind of how we're, we're focused on that area because safety has to be the top priority. And in areas that we're seeing real safety issues for, for our most vulnerable with our bike and pedestrians, we have to say that's our priority. And that means we have to sacrifice the other parts of it. Tim, Holly? Yeah, so just, just to, to add on to that, uh, Secretary Slater hit, hit the nail on the head on, on that. I, I would just simply add part of that collaboration is also with our metropolitan planning organizations as well as with the counties because as, as Greg mentioned, that land use changed um, and, and, and we need to be able to adapt. But at the same time, it, it, I always, you know, maybe it's because I like pie rather than cake. There, there's only so many pieces of the pie. You can cut it up differently, but you still have the same size pie. So uh, if, if we're gonna, if we're gonna emphasize safety, that means that we're gonna sacrifice mobility in those corridors. So if, if we still need, a mobility corridor that's where we got to look for work with our metropolitan planning organizations to figure out which corridors are going to be mobility based and which ones are going to be more vulnerable uh user based so uh, it's it's really about that collaboration and uh um i went to virginia tech so um go, go tech i guess let's go with that <laughs> I can add on from the, the transit perspective, uh, and I'm a planner, not engineer, engineer, so I've got none of this, but um, <laughs> we, uh, I, I think a couple ways that we're looking at improving pedestrian safety, particularly around transit, is partnering with local jurisdictions on, on grant opportunities. Um, so if there's ever, you know, grants that Howard County wants to go for, especially around transit stops and stations, we, we do look at pedestrian safety, especially, you know, around crossings. Uh, ADA improvements. Um, we're making a huge investment in ADA improvements with the big equity focus uh, currently. Um, and then also a TOD. Uh, are there uh, other opportunities for TOD and really making those, those walkable, bikeable communities uh, around transit? Um, you know, Dorsey Station is one that we're hoping in the next few months to have a, a RFP come out on, but other um, opportunities for, for TOD around the county is definitely something we would, would like to partner on. Thank you all. Holly, you might want to mention small area plans that you've been working with us on. Oh, Th that is a great reminder. <laughs> Thanks, Ruth. Yeah, uh, uh, one of the things in the Central Maryland Regional Transit Plan, um, it doesn't get as much attention as some of our, our bigger projects, but is just as impactful um, are the, the small area plans where we really dive in to the needs of, of transit uh, in smaller areas. Um, so I think the Route 1 corridor is one that is uh, mostly done at this point uh, and has a lot of really good recommendations for transit improvements as well as pedestrian ADA improvements in the area. Thanks, Bruce, for that reminder. Sure, and uh, Council Member Walsh will be sharing that with you shortly. It's in draft form and it, it does include some recommendations on route extensions um, up up uh, into Baltimore County too, but that, you know, not funded, but like Holly said, prepping for grant opportunities and, and other potential um, sources. Um, I'd like to pause and have our interpreter um, speak to rise to the top of the list again. Hi, uh, KSL interpreter. Thank you very much. Uh, Council Chair Walsh, do you have anything else? No, that was it. Thanks. Okay. I believe Senator Hester has joined us, so I'll um, turn it over to her. Hi, everybody. Uh, sorry for being late. I had a prior prior engagement. Um, I wanted to start by thanking uh, the secretary and Terry Seuss for working so closely with us on that bike access, you know, um, point along 10 Oaks and third, the whole 32 expansion. It's been, uh, I think it's going to be a real, real, real help to the bike community and will increase safety over there. So I, I think it was mentioned already, but I just wanted to hear it directly from me. Thank you so much for working with us on that. Thank you. I know Terry did a great job and Administrator Smith was working hard on that one as well. So, so now on to the, the, hard, the hard ask. Um, I think uh, Delegate Watson might have mentioned, but you know, probably the number one um, concern that, that we get um, related to traffic and congestion and safety is I-70. Um, and, um, I, you know, I, I know that a lot of the safety issues are caused um, by congestion. So, so my question was, um, 
you know, the, the projects along 70 have been number two on the priority list for, for a long time now. Do you have an estimate of the funding required for the design and engineering of each element identified in the county priority letter? So that would be Marriott'sville Road, the I-70 widening and US-29 uh, I-70 interchange. So do you have a cost estimate for the design and engineering? And then do you have an order of magnitude for the actual construction of each of those components? I, I don't have that in front of me. I'm just flipping through my materials. But what what we, we discussed a little bit earlier on this call and, and Administrator Smith can expand on it uh, as well is, you know, what we've been trying to do is we've identified some innovative solutions in that corridor that really uh, are looking at Route 70, Route 29, uh, 100 or 99, kind of all of that in kind of one system and, and how we can improve that whole system uh, through the use of technology and intelligent transportation systems. You know, so we think there, uh, there's a significant investment that we could make. So for instance, you can widen all those roadways, but we think you can get three quarters of the way there with less than half of the investment and stay within the existing pavement area and not have to actually widen the roadway. Um, but, but we're working on that. I don't know if Tim has the, the estimate on that, but I don't think it would, I have to be sensitive to the fact that I've worked in transportation so long that sometimes the big numbers, you become desensitized to, to big numbers. And I say it's not a lot, but I, I, do you have that handy, Tim? Yeah, so just to, to, to echo what the secretary said, we're looking at that entire system, meaning US 29, US 40, I-70, Maryland 99, kind of all together as a system. And we feel like between using the existing footprint as well as in, in implementing new technology, we can we can significantly improve mobility through the corridor without sacrificing safety. And a lot of that might be meaning using the existing footprint, meaning using our existing shoulders to add capacity and just adding extra lanes would add capacity, but it, we're also impacting, uh, you know, we're trying to be good environmental stewards as well. Um, but just the, just looking at the, the kind of the transportation systems management operations, the, the TISMO solution that we like to refer to, that's probably in design and construction is probably in that range of 50 million. If you're looking at just the entire I-70 corridor from, you know, say uh, 40 to the, uh, to, set, uh, uh, to the, the county line, we're probably, and, I, and I'm, I'm the same way, I don't want to desensitize you to the numbers, we're probably in the order of 100 to 200 million, if not more, for that type of improvement. Whereas we think we can get, like the secretary said, three quarters of the way there with the capacity improvements without sacrificing safety with a $50 million technical, more uh, kind of a smarter solution. Well. I like to count myself as an environmentalist too, so I'm really happy that you guys are considering that. I think my concern though is is that you know we want to ask for the right thing in our priority letter, mm -hmm. and I'd like to start unbundling some of these numbers. Like you, okay. like if we if we're not going to get 85 million dollars worth of improvement, then can we get the design and engineering for you know two of these two of these areas or something? Like I, I mean, I think it was Delegate Turner who said you know hey. You know, I've been a delegate for like 20 years and we haven't had any improvements on 29 and 70. And if, if you can just get that, you know, start to make some progress there will really help, you know, people. So if we could unbundle that, look at and look at the TSMO improvements and, and really say, you know, what can we what can we do, especially this infrastructure, you know, package potentially from the federal government. Like, I want us to be ready to go when we get that money. And this is definitely high mm -hmm. on the county's priority list. Absolutely. Yeah, Greg, let me chime in there. So I've, we've put some seed money into trying to advance our design for the TISMO solution. And what we want to do is be prepared if an infrastructure bill is, is signed. That, that's one of our top priorities as a state, that system one, meaning that I-70 US-29 corridor, that, that will be one of our top priorities. That is wonderful news. Well, if I, anything I can do to help, you know, just, just let me know. I'll, I'll make some calls to DC or whatever it is. I think the one thing I'll, I'll kind of point out here is it seems that uh, maybe our next step is to get that design concept and that solution in front of, of the council and our representatives uh, and our delegation here in Howard County to, to so you can become familiar with what we're talking about with this system-wide solution. 
I think everybody's familiar with some of the other projects that have been around for a decade or so, but these kind of new way of thinking on this project within the existing right of way, it might be really good to kind of get that in front, front of you as a group. I agree. And if you could, if we could, if we could look at the whole thing as a system with the TSMO, but then also start to break down the cost of the individual pieces of it, um, that will help us to, you know, re revamp our priority letter if we have to. Absolutely. One of the more challenging issues we have specifically in this part of the state with adding more pavement is trying to manage the stormwater that's coming off that new impervious surface. And, and that's always a, a challenge for us. So anytime we can stay within that existing pavement, it's really going to help us because we're going to have to rate the drainage at the same time anyway. Senator Hester, can I just jump in here and suggest that we could set up such a, a briefing with the delegation um, early in in January, if not before. Um, I think that would be very helpful for all of us. And so, Secretary Slater, I don't know if one of your if your people could reach out to us sure. instead of a time. I think the entire delegation would be interested in that. Great. We're happy to do that. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Um, good conversation. I'd like to turn it over to our other council member who is on the call. Um, uh, council member Mercer Rigby. Thank you, Director Gartner, um, and thank you, Secretary Slater and your team for being here tonight. I, I truly appreciate all the work that you've done leading up to tonight um, and also as well our county executive ball and our state delegation. Um, none of these things that we've talked about tonight would happen uh, but for you and your efforts. So I, I truly appreciate it, um, especially some of the route one. It's hard going at the end because everyone's already talked about so many of the things, but um, Route 1, Dobbin, the flash service, um, those are very important to us and I'm very glad to see progress there. I am very concerned uh, when we look at some of the comparisons of funding for road widening and things like that compared to the statewide allocations for bikeway and TAP grants. Um, you know, it is so hard to get these projects moving and they're so much smaller fiscally and just work-wise, and they have a big impact in our communities, especially, um, I mean, frankly, especially now with COVID, everyone is so disconnected and being out together on these paths is one of the most connecting ways. Even if it's, you know, two neighbors going past each other as they're commuting to work and saying, hi, it's, it's small, but it's big, if that makes sense. Um, also, I know Ms. Um, Councilmember Walsh mentioned it, but US-1 safety and pedestrian projects. This is, it weighs on all of our minds who represent Route 1. It, we get emails and phone calls about, you know, what's happened to people and their families. Um, and, it, and it doesn't have to be like this. We, and we, we actively want it to not be like this. So we appreciate your design efforts. Um, and it's hard to adapt to the pace of, of uh, government um, as a new, <laughs> you know, you, you see it on the list and you think, oh, it's coming. Um, and it still takes so long to get there. So um, we, you know, the sooner, the faster, the better, because uh, we, it's, it's, it's hard to wait. And every time you get another email, you just wish it could have been averted um, by having that infrastructure in place. And let me see, the last two things on my pre-prepared list were about our, our shortage of bus drivers. Um, I know that it is, it is everywhere that you're experiencing it, that we're experiencing it, but if there is anything um, that you guys can do to, to help, um, we would appreciate it. Um, Absolutely. Let me touch on that and then I may kick it over to Administrator Nizer to touch on a little bit, but you know, the, the, the bus driver shortage, really the CDL shortage nationwide is a significant issue. You know, I, on the news tonight, they were covering a grocery store who had to kind of fluctuate their grocery prices because they couldn't get deliveries because there's not enough truck drivers. We are significantly short on our, our drivers for our mobility service for our disabled citizens. And, and that's really impacting us. And we're trying to figure out how we can maximize those issues. We have, uh, you know, our transit service is limited. 
uh, probably more by the availability of drivers today than it is the availability of funding and to getting out on the operating environment. So it's been a real challenge for us in the school system, but uh, Administrator Neiser has worked really hard to get a specific day over at the MBA where we'll be testing uh, bus drivers that, that are trying to get a test for their okay. CDL, um, trying to focus on a, several different locations throughout the state, but maybe, Chrissy, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, thanks, Secretary Slater, and you're exactly right. It is a nationwide CDL shortage, which really has been existing for years, but made worse by COVID with the additional deliveries that are happening. So talk to you this Saturday, um, and, you know, we put it out to all the school systems. We've been in regular contact with all the counties, even before school started, because we know every year, you know, it's a rush to get the drivers through, but the shortage has just made that worse. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of slots filled, so we put out a putting out another release tomorrow just to encourage everybody. We've got plenty of availability, but um, as I've told everybody, you know, if, if Saturday doesn't work or your drivers aren't ready yet, be in contact with us. Let us know because we've been fitting in drivers at other times that are convenient to make sure it works. We know this is a priority. Um, you know, as I always say, they're, they're our most precious cargo. We want to make sure they're making it to and from school safely. So um, if there's anything we can do, feel free to reach out to me directly and I'm happy to uh, assist with that process. Thank you. And I have to say, I, I really appreciate it. I feel like I've heard a variety of creative solutions or just, you know, thinking outside the box. So how, like, it doesn't have to be a massive thing. It's how can you iteratively make it better and scheduling everybody on one CDL day to get that through and get that done is certainly one way to do that. Um, we're working hard to kind of move up the pace of some of our projects. I will, if it makes you feel any better, I bet two years ago, I'll never forget it. I had, I called um, uh, a delegate to let her know that we were gonna install a new traffic light at a location. And on the other side of the phone, it was like super silence. And I finally, um, she spoke up and she said, she said, Greg, that's where I started my city council political career, trying to get that traffic light. 35 years ago or so she said are you telling me you're going to finally put the light up i believe it you're going to have like delegate pendergrass you're going to have guy gazzoni you're going to have J jen terrassa they're all going to be very excited for all of these improvements on the <laughs> south side of route one um because it it's it's that important. Um, I'm going out on Saturday to try and help get with land acquisitions for uh, Guilford Road, which intersects with with Route One. So, Great. if you want to put me to use there, I'll go out for you too. Um, and and I think the the last thing I would harken back to is the comments about the Penn Line and the Camden Line. Mm -hmm. um, they sound like a lot of great improvements, and I think that regionally they will it'll be really beneficial. And I think that that's great. And here in Howard County, you know, we, I don't think um, most of our residents won't be able to necessarily share in as many of those benefits simply because of our location. And, and I appreciate the work that's been done with CSX. I would say that since, you know, the pen connector will be a bit more north and the improvements to the pen line are coming, and we still have many challenges in working with CSX, um, that if there's a way to look at sort of outside the box solutions, how do we get Howard Countyans to Odenton, to BWI? How can we um, better connect ourselves regionally? Um, that would be my, my request. So thank you all so much. Great, thank you. Happy to look at that. I know uh, one of the real opportunities we have is our transit oriented development program that we're you know, looking at the Dorsey Mark Station, but also, um, Laurel Mark and, and some others. Yes, and Savage and you know the county, we've been really focused in in connecting Savage um, mm -hmm. with itself. And I and I really could envision a future where you can easily get from sort of Main Street Savage right over to the Mark station in a safe way. Um, right. and and it would it would really connect our community. So we had just one final thought. We had a program um, that we've started to develop over the last probably five to eight years um, called STOAs. And STOAs are what we call short trip opportunity areas. And so what you do is you take a mark station or a transit hub, and then you take a radius of three miles or five miles, and you look at that as an opportunity that if we're able to pull that network radius around that station and provide enhanced, protected, 
infrastructure for bikes and pedestrians, you're able to create an environment where somebody can go access that transit hub without ever actually having to get into a car. And so, you know, that five mile radius is, is kind of a good radius for the everyday, not the everyday rider, but the, the every person rider, you know, and all levels. You know, you start getting into to 10, and, 10 and, and some folks are just not willing to kind of ride that far, but, um, but we, we like that opportunity and that program to create that network around that transit hub uh, for opportunities for people to access those transit lines without ever actually getting into a car. I mean, that's fantastic. And I, and I will say e-bikes are welcomed with open arms by many Howard Countyans. Um, so I think that that will even help get more people on that five mile um five mile cusp so i thank you very much and i look forward to working with y'all thank you okay thank you very much council member um i think that is all the questions that i we have um from elected officials but i'm going to pause here to see if anybody else speaks up um from either the state delegation council or there are several um staff members representing other uh, delegates and, and council members. So uh, thank you to them for keeping in touch while you know multiple meetings go going on tonight. Um, I do have uh, some comments that we've received on on Facebook, just you know one or two that I can uh, I can jump to just for a minute if we don't have any other um, comments from elected officials. So again, I'll cause and I see Delegate Watson. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good. Um, just checking on sort of this. This problem that we've had in the past that I know the prior council member Weinstein worked on with the state with regard to Frederick Road and the section between historic Ellicott City and Route 29, um, what, which we call the West End of El historic Ellicott City and the speed of the vehicles and pedestrian um, accommodation there. Do you do you know what has been done there and if there is any plan to do more and whether or not a traffic study has been done recently in that area? I have to see if Terry or Tim might have that. I, the only work I've done on the Frederick Road side is on the Baltimore County side. So uh, maybe Tim and Terry, do you have any uh, insight on that? I have to lean on Terry on this one. <laughs> sure, thank you. I, I apologize. Um, my speakers were in and out. Could you could you quickly restate the question? Yes, the section of Frederick Road between Historic Ellicott City and Route 29. There was some work that had been done on that uh, in conjunction with previous council member John Weinstein a few years ago. Just wondering if there's been any updated traffic studies in that area. If there's anything else planned to help bring down the speed and increase pedestrian safety. Um, there are no recent studies, but but we can certainly have the team take a, a quick uh, look at that as well, and we can reach out to your office. Great, that would be great. Um, anything we can do to increase the the safety of that area for both people in the cars and pedestrians, we really need to try to do what we can there. Bruce? Thank you, Bruce. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, that was that was indeed one of the questions that came in um, to us on, by email as well. So I think the, um, so. It's it's a good one to have. There was another comment, um, Mr. Secretary, just regarding this section of Maryland 32 between 29 and 95, and some of the challenges with congestion and um, the access ramps there. Um, so just something to note. We can forward to you to uh, Terry to, uh, so she sees that. Um, and then otherwise, I think there was a comment on just the, the speeding, which Chrissy kind of referenced um, during the pandemic on, especially on US 29, um, as a concern there, anything for the state police um, could, could do. So um, I think that's uh, pretty much it. Um, so uh, I'll note, Bruce, that the speeding has been a real significant challenge for us in this pandemic. Our vehicle miles traveled went down significantly and our fatality numbers went up and it was very much related to aggressive driving and speeding. I, I can add to that in my private sector career, I'm in the insurance business and we are definitely seeing that through claims that the severity is up in automobile mm -hmm. accidents um, during the pandemic. So the insurance company are dealing with that as well. 
Yeah, a lot of the crashes were single vehicle crashes, but because of the high rate of speed, just much more severe, and unfortunately, it led to more fatalities. Um, you know, it wasn't as many crashes, uh, it wasn't as many multiple cra uh, fatality crashes that you sometimes see, but just the speed being so high and dangerous driving behavior. I mean, things that we've never seen, people doing donuts on major highways um, yeah. and, and just really kind of risky behavior. So we've certainly tried to modify even our education message because of COVID, because we're seeing different things and, and even impairment during the day, um, which has been reported by law enforcement to us. So we know that COVID has had a lot of impacts and we're just trying to make sure we're being responsive to that and not just putting the same messaging out that we've done, trying to really modify that to what we're seeing. Okay. Um... Looks like we uh, might get about 18 minutes back here, Mr. Secretary. So <laughs> thank you to everyone for, um, for joining us. Um, if there's uh, no other questions, I think we will follow up with a, a couple emails and uh, work on that uh, January briefing. We might want to add maybe a topic that uh, interests some other parts of the county too to the delegation briefing, uh, Delegate Watson, if, if uh, but we can keep in touch about that. Yes. Uh, you heard us one a lot so i think um yes. yeah that might be a, a good one to add so yeah and um let me just add one other quick thing to that which would be we, we get a lot of complaints about uh neighbors neighborhoods that border some of these highways about um basically hot rod vehicles making very loud noises as they drive by <laughs> Oh, and whether or not that is regulated in any way, whether it fall, falls under your domain, but how we handle that and trying to um, keep the traffic quieter for residents. And this isn't normal traffic. These are these are vehicles that are like souped up, making these yeah. drag racing noises. I don't know how else to describe them. But unfortunately, like, unfortunately, what, some of the regulations were probably written around. Um, you know, something called Jake brakes, which is more of kind of the hydraulic brake systems on trucks. And they haven't really kind of caught up to some of these smaller kind of hot rod type vehicles. But I don't know anything on your radar, Tim, in terms of regulation there. Um, I haven't seen a whole lot of that lately. I, I could jump in on that one too. Right. If I didn't want. Um, sure. So, yeah, Maryland State Police regulates that safety inspection. The problem is, and that's required anytime a vehicle is, is newly titled, the problem is people um, modify these vehicles after the safety inspection, but they do have the authority to issue citations um, for equipment repairs, things that don't that don't meet the regulations. So I know MSP has um, worked with communities in certain areas um, where they've had had concerns about these issues. So it's something we could certainly pass along um, if there's a specific neighborhood. Um, if you want to shoot me an email, I'd be happy to connect you with yeah. the folks at MSP. I guess that the, they have to catch them in the act. No, right. That's the problem, yeah. right? Yeah. Exactly. And oftentimes they're going 90 miles an hour. So it's, yeah, exactly. it's, it's okay. We can um, think I about just, that. Thank you. I'll just say that that's also, that's a, certainly an issue on 32. We hear from a lot of constituents. So um, I will absolutely follow up with you. Thank you. All right. Um, I was re reminded in the chat that um, that um, Council Member Young did submit some uh, some comments and question to you, uh, Mr. Secretary. I already forwarded that um, oh, to your staff. So I just wanted to um, reiterate some of the, the policy priorities that she uh, had in in her letter, um, or let you know that they're there. So I want to thank her for sending those in. Thank you, Bruce. This is my fourteenth um, CTP season. So I uh, well. <laughs> so I did, I started doing CTP tours when I was a brand new planning director. Um, John Pakari was our secretary. Neil Peterson was our highway administrator. I was probably about, you know, maybe 10 years into my career. So 14 years later, um, I've done it in a variety of roles now. So we're in number 14 now. All right. Well, when you get to the end of all your meetings this, this fall, just remember what we said in Howard County. That's all. <laughs> Thanks, Bruce. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night.